Hey everyone, this is Raw Matt. I do not upload content to my channel very much because I'm busy making content for Standing for Truth YouTube channel. Make sure to come and check out his channel and see all of the hard work we've been doing. The Bible is the history book of the universe. Starting with this as an assumption, we can test the Bible to scientific discoveries and see how well this fits. The Bible tells us clearly that Adam is the father of all people. We read in Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We see no evolutionary history of mankind here. There is not even a hint at fish to fisherman evolution in this verse. According to the Bible, we were made perfect and in the image of God. You mean this isn't grandpa? Put a dress on your monkey and take her to the prom, guys. For those suffering from science denialism, if you think you're so vastly similar to an ape, do us all a favor and go find yourself a chimpanzee. Dress her up nicely, put some makeup on her, and take her to the prom. See the looks you get and watch what people say about your hot date. A light bulb may finally go off in your head when you quickly realize that she's not so similar to you after all. Now, it's a direct prediction from the Bible and from a literal interpretation of Genesis that we are not related to apes, that we are actually specially created in the image of God, and that's actually what we see genetically. For example, when evolutionists or someone of an opposing worldview says that human and chimps, they're genetically identical by 98 to 99%, that's based on preferential and selective treatment of data. It's cherry-picked data. They're not including non-aligned DNA, gaps, copy number variations, and size differences. When you actually look at what the genetic identity is, it's less than 88%, and that's over 400 million DNA differences that actually exist between the two species. And there's significant DNA uh, DNA sequence discontinuity between the two genomes that evolution cannot explain or account for. Even the claimed human chromosome fusion number two, that alleged site where the fusion supposedly took place actually represents a highly organized functional gene. And these shared ge genetic mistakes that you might have heard of as pseudogenes, those are actually now known to be functional DNA elements and not mistakes. You can look at orphan genes, for example. What is the reality? Humans are not apes and they were created separately and uniquely in the image of God. Not only does the Bible prove this, but so does DNA evidence. Once again, the Bible is the history book of the universe. We read in Genesis 2, 21 to 22, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. We started with two people, one man and one woman. These are very significant statements about genetics. Modern genetics has discovered Adam and Eve. Noah's flood, the Tower of Babel, and it's written in the genome. The evidence for biblical creation is overwhelming. The Bible makes predictions. Looking at the Adam and Eve story in the biblical base model, we can make numerous predictions. If we only started with two people, all the people today should have a low genetic diversity. If we started with a million people, you're gonna have a lot of genes floating around a population of a million strong. But if you only started with two people, that really restricts the diversity today. Over deep time, any large population will accumulate enormous numbers of mutations, resulting in enormous amounts of genetic diversity. This is a serious problem for evolutionary theory and those of opposing worldviews because it is now clear that mankind has very limited genetic variation. This is predicted directly from the Bible, a literal interpretation of Genesis. While the observed low genetic diversity is a massive problem from the evolutionary perspective, this is most certainly expected and predicted from the biblical perspective. From the biblical model, we all come from just two people, Adam and Eve. This obviously means that limited diversity, it's easy to explain. The Bible has predicted this. If the Bible is correct and Adam really is our ancestor, as we just read from the Bible passage moments ago, there should only be one male ancestor of humanity. The small number of mutations that separate modern men from the sequence of Y chromosome Adam indicates that this man lived in the relatively recent past. Based upon the actual observed mutation rate for the human Y chromosome, studies show that Y chromosome Adam lived just thousands of years ago. And these findings are strong evidence supporting the literal Adam of the Bible. And that mitochondrial DNA, the little piece of DNA inherited exclusively from our mothers, that means we can build a family tree of all the females in the world and there should only be one female ancestor of everyone on earth today if Genesis is accurate. The small number of mutations that separate modern people from the sequence of mitochondrial Eve indicates that mitochondrial Eve lived in the recent past. For evolutionists and those of opposing worldviews, none of these facts have to be true. 
all genes should come in two versions since Eve was taken from Adam. We just read that in the passage moments ago. She probably got Adam's genome, except for the Y chromosome, of course. These biblical predictions are all exactly what we find in modern human genetics. What's the chance of the Bible being made up? And the biblical story mirrors what we actually see in human genetics today. Genesis 9, 18 to 19. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. The Bible, as I said before, is the history book of the universe. Further predictions based on the passage we just read. Look at Noah's flood. This story tells us that all people should be closely related. It tells us there should be only a few mitochondrial DNA lines as Shem, Ham, and Japheth's wives, and only one Y chromosome since it's only Noah. His three sons would have inherited his Y chromosome, and we should have significant evidence of rapid population growth. It turns out that this too is exactly what we find in modern genetics. This all did not have to be true. Even more predictions, the Tower of Babel account. We've, we have found a single dispersal of all people in the relatively recent past, traveling in small people groups into uninhabited territory through the Middle East. They call it the out of Africa story, but these are all biblical based predictions. I want you to look at this tree. You can find this in the book, Replacing Darwin and in the work of Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. This is several hundred human individuals. The tips of these branches represent human individuals. Distance of lines, the very long lines would be lots of DNA differences and short lines would be almost none at all. What do you notice about this tree? This tree represents various people groups around the globe. Many of these lines come together as three major nodes. This is a fact that evolutionists even acknowledge. These are the three major haplogroups. There are three major groupings and subgroupings. Length of lines connecting the groups are short and lines radiating out from the groups are long. Reading scripture, we know our maternal ancestry goes back to Eve. Population would then grow and shrink to eight at the time of the flood and then grow again momentarily, ending with the splitting of people groups at the Tower of Babel. One Eve in the beginning, population then shrinks to eight people. Noah, Noah's wife, three sons and three wives of Noah's sons. Three boys get their mitochondrial DNA from mom, and then it ends. Genesis 9 says that these three, the entire world was repopulated. We get our mitochondrial DNA from their three wives. The history of humanity is in our genome. What we know about mitochondrial DNA of humans fits the 6,000 year time scale explains the three major haplogroups and the relative differences between pre and post flood humanity. We're making testable and falsifiable predictions. For example, the tree that I just showed you, it contains the stamp of the history of civilization, the Roman Empire, Persian Empire, and Greeks. And this is just the start of the, the sorts of studies that are actually being done. Y chromosome, for example, disproves human evolution. It, it demonstrates Adam. The, the, the Y chromosome between humans and apes, it's just, it's, it's far too different. We can look to the pre-existing heterozygosity model, pre-existing functional DNA differences, which also makes testable, testable predictions on junk DNA, on what's functional, on what's not. Like I said, all evidence here demonstrates the truth of biblical creation. Um, gene conversion and recombination are two major mechanisms that we look to in that model, as you know, Matt, in the created heterozygosity hypothesis, because the evolutionists, they explain all DNA differences as a result of mutation. Just like in my debate the other day with, with the biologist, uh, his name's Aaron on, on T-Jump's channel, I was going over the coalescence time for mitochondrial DNA. It's only 6,000 years. It's consistent with a biblical based model. I mean, mitochondrial DNA worldwide is incredibly similar. We know based on observed mutation rates, uh, mitochondrial Eve lived just 6,000 years ago. So that's consistent for us. We don't need to invoke evolutionary phylogenetic or divergence calculations and assumptions to come up with that number. So just like Dr. Herman Mays objected, and Aaron, uh, this biologist the other day objected. He said, well, the nuclear DNA, you know, the coalescence time there is hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So how do you explain that discrepancy? And I asked him, I said, well, how do we explain the origin of nuclear DNA? Just like Dr. Nathaniel Jensen asked Herman Mays, his answer was, I don't know, you tell me. And it just shows that they don't understand the model because we explain the majority of nuclear DNA has created functional diversity. So that's why our model is consistent.
coalescence wise it's consistent with with the nuclear dna being created which leads to testable predictions on speciation rates mutation rates dna function these predictions are coming true more and more every single day and the mitochondrial dna based on a constant rate of mutation since creation so uh, you know they they flow perfectly and then the evolutionists on the other hand they've had wrong predictions on on both compartments that means we don't need to explain all the diversity as you know matt through mutation we can look to recombination and gene conversion recombination is like shuffling a deck of cards you're going to get new varieties new traits every single generation you know the chromosomes are exchanging their genetic information i mean in forming sex cells chromosomes undergo recombination gene conversion this is basic but gene conversion it's similar to recombination but it's it's only tiny amounts of, of dna that are involved and that can explain linkage groups right because these linkage groups are linked together so recombination doesn't independently assort them but gene conversion can but it's funny because these linkage groups in general are a killer for evolution because these linkage groups are essentially linked forever occasionally you know they can be broken apart with gene conversion but for the most part they're linked together forever which means they can only undergo degeneration even if you throw one beneficial mutation in there, it's going to be diluted down by all the deleterious mutations. So there's just so, so many problems with their model. What do you think, Matt? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, man. Um, the gene conversion for evolutionists is their worst nightmare when it comes to the chromosome because they think that the Y chromosome is going extinct because of its smaller size in comparison to the X chromosome. See, they think that the X and Y chromosome were once identical in size but then it supposedly lost like 1,400 genes through time. This is wrong. This is the wrong starting point. Thus, they get the wrong conclusion. I want you to think about it like this. A little bit of damage on a little section would cause lots of damage, right? As opposed to a large section of the genome where the same amount of damage wouldn't be nearly as bad. And this is exactly what we look at when we see the X and Y chromosome. This is why it's a nail in the coffin, as I said, because they actually found that a new study looking at the Y chromosome, which was published by the Public Library of Science, they sequenced portions of the Y chromosome from 62 different men, and they found that it is prone to large-scale structural rearrangement, allowing gene amplification and mitigates gene loss in this region. That same exact study showed that the Y chromosome has developed unusual structures called palindromes, which protect it from degradation. They recorded high amounts of gene conversion events in this palindromic sequences on the Y chromosome. And they found that it basically is a copy and paste process that allows damaged genes in that region to be completely repaired. So using this undamaged backup copy as a template. So this new discovery of the palindrome structures that have high rates of gene convergence to protect the Y chromosome from degradation completely proves that the Y chromosome does not degrade, nor was it ever the same size as the X chromosome. So once again, observation completely disproves the hypothetical story of evolution. They even admit that the evolutionary process of the Y chromosome is not well understood. But don't worry, they will wield story after story telling you that it's true, no matter what, regardless of the evidence. But there is more regarding gene conversion. How about how gene conversion rates help to prove Adam and Eve lived just 6,000 years ago? Again, this is easy to prove using math from peer-reviewed studies. You see, in our model, Adam and Eve were created with nuclear DNA heterozygosity, meaning that their genomes represented the first haplotype blocks. Since they were the first individuals alive, their haplotype blocks were the length of the entire chromosomes. Therefore, every recombination and gene conversion event since that time would fragment these initial long blocks into smaller haplotype blocks. So, to predict how many blocks would have arisen in each individual after 6,000 years, all you have to do is take the published peer-reviewed rates of recombination events and the published rates of the frequency of gene conversions and then combine them into a total rate of haplotype block divisions per generation. The combined gene conversions and recombination rates is then divided by a range of generation time for humans ranging from 15 to 35 years old. This is going to determine the rate of haplotype blocks divisions per year. By multiplying these rates by 6,000 years, you then get the number of haplotype blocks 
that would result from 6,000 years of recombination and gene conversions in each generation in a single lineage. What are the results? Again, the created heterozygosity model starting with Adam 6,000 years ago, followed by a constant rate of recombination and gene conversion, explains the number of haplotype blocks present in the human day population. So again, observable evidence we can see and put to the test directly looking at gene conversions, generational times, and recombination events validates young earth creation and falsifies evolutionism once more. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has published two peer-reviewed papers on molecular clocks, specifically on the human Y chromosome and the genetic signal regarding the history of civilization. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has put in print very solid predictions regarding genetics. More specifically, the genetic signal found in DNA. These papers that are peer reviewed are papers that I told T-Jump in our debate would be out soon with fulfilled predictions. And that very thing is what these papers prove. Now, the title of one of these papers is Testing the Predictions of the Young Earth Y Chromosome Molecular Clock. Population growth curves confirm the recent origin of human Y chromosome differences. These papers are huge. Read them both because this just goes to show how dead evolutionism really is. Creationists are the ones making future testable predictions. These predictions are both repeatable and falsifiable. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.